Uh, so my name is Keith Scott. I work for the MITRE Corporation. Uh, I also support uh, a couple of projects that are going on at NASA. One is the Data System Standards Program, and, and another is a project within Advanced Exploration Systems that's supporting uh, the, the maturation of these communication protocols that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so just, you know, show of hands, who likes the internet? Right? Lots of people. Uh, the, the way to suss out the network engineers is to say, who thinks you can make the internet work between here and Mars? And sometimes what you get is people will like, look at you funny for a while and they'll say, well, yeah, I could sort of make that work. Um, the, the answer is, you could sort of make uh, the internet protocols work between here and Mars, uh, but you know, it sort of goes to that, the old joke, you, know, you, could, you could do that, but you shouldn't. Um, uh, typically, the way we uh, space missions communicate now uh, is direct to Earth, and in particular, uh, the model for communication is a single link between the Mission Operations Center and the spacecraft. Uh, and the space link actually from the spacecraft down to the ground station is then tunneled across the internet back to the mission control center. Uh, with the, the, uh, uh, some of the rover uh, projects on Mars, what we discovered is uh, you can do a lot better if you actually relay communications through something else. Uh, there was a, a mission package that was put onto uh, spirit and opportunity that was designed as uh, just an experiment to look at relaying uh, and the prospect of doing that. They meant NASA and the international space community had developed a set of protocols for sort of near, uh, you know, near planetary body communication instead of the standard telemetry and telecommand that they use for deep space uh, comms. And what they figured out quickly was, oh my God, because the data that they can get down by relaying much greater than they can get if they have to go directly from the, the rover on the surface of Mars back to Earth. Uh, they also figured out that what they, uh, what they had was a power problem. Uh, they had enough power on any given day, or the, the rover could generate enough power from its solar panels on any given day that they could drive or they could talk. Uh, and they really wanted to do both. Uh, and so nowadays, about 93% of the data actually comes back via this relay mechanism. The, the stuff that's going on now is not the kind of thing that I'm going to be talking about. The, the relay that's going on now is, is sort of a one-off. Uh, it's, it's very purpose-built and, and, and actually has got a couple of, of sort of idiosyncrasies to it because of the way that the, the data is treated as it comes back. And what we're looking at, this, this work that I'm talking about started about 17, 18 years ago. Uh, and we were looking at really taking that and generalizing it and being able to build a, a larger communication system uh, out of being able to relay in space and between space missions. Uh, so that gave birth to this thing called the, the Solar System Internet Network, or Solar System Internet, uh, which then morphed into a thing that is, that is now, if you search in the literature, look for things called delay and disrupt tolerant networking. Uh, that delay, the, the, this notion of delay and disruption uh, is, is sort of intimately tied together, right? Uh, the, we, we started out thinking, well, Mars is four minutes away when it's close, and it's like 20 minutes away when it's far, uh, and, and that's a really long delay. Uh, it turns out that that's not the delay that you care about, right? The, the delay that you care about is that you don't have time on the deep space antenna until Thursday of next week. So, you know, the, the four minutes that it's going to take you to get to Mars is nothing compared to, you know, six days that, it's, that you, your data's got to wait before it can go out. Uh, so we got together with a couple of people at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, and, and luckily we had a, sort of an in uh, to somebody who, who knew Vince Cerf, who's one of the fathers of the Internet, uh, and pulled him in and got him stitched in as a uh, visiting distinguished scientist at JPL and started looking at how can you generalize this? How can you generalize what they were doing with the rovers and relay communications into something that, that sort of looks like the internet protocols in that, it, or rather behaves like the internet protocols in that you can address data, you can send it, you don't have to worry about managing every one of the, data, every one of the links in the data communication path uh, by hand, which is sort of what happens now. Uh, and, and simply address data and let it flow. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that in that you know, 
uh, mission managers are very, very concerned with you know certain bits of their data, and there are lots of uh, uh, lots lots of desire to have data prioritizations. So we had to worry about that. Um, but uh, essentially, to take this uh, layered architecture, build it out so that we could then take spacecraft maybe that had completed their primary mission uh, and, and were not doing anything else uh, and turn them into relays to support future spacecraft that were off doing, doing their kind of work. Uh, back in 1998, uh, I think, uh, we actually flew uh, these, these protocols on uh, a mission that was just like that. It was the, uh, the, the Dynet mission. If you remember, there was a mission to a comet that was good, not, not the landing on the comet mission, but the one that took you know, a, a spacecraft and went out and shot at a comet and looked at all the ejecta that came off of it. So, well, once it did that, the, the, the carrier spacecraft was still around and wasn't doing much and went into an extended mission. Uh, and we got an opportunity to run uh, the, the, the bundle protocol uh, back and forth to that spacecraft at light times that were like a minute. Uh, so they weren't, you know, weren't very deep space, uh, but it was uh, longer, longer than uh, latencies than you get on Earth. Um, so why do this, right? Uh, there are a number of things, as I said before, you can sort of try to make the internet protocols work. International, uh, the International Consortium that deals with uh, space communication protocols is a thing called the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems. It's like the IETF for space communication. Uh, they spent a lot of time looking at what you could do to TCP and try to make it actually work uh, back and forth between here and Mars. So they're, they're, if you know how TCP works, you, know, you send data, you get acknowledgments, uh, and, and there's a three-way handshake that goes on in the beginning so that you can set up sequence numbers and agree on that with the, the, bet between the sender and the receiver. Um, so they went through a whole bunch of machinations about, you know, what could you do? Well, I could, you know, I could ship the state to the receiver. Uh, so that I don't have to do this three-way handshake, and I could, you know, I could blow out all the timers so that I can deal with these really long round trip times, and I could suspend the timers. And this sort of starts to get into the problems that we see, right? Because what we have are, uh, when you're talking about spacecraft that are orbiting the planets, you've got communications that are that are there sometimes and not there other times, right? You've got an orbit that goes around the backside of a planet, and all of a sudden you don't get to see it for some number of hours. Uh, and, until it comes back. And, oh, by the way, while it's on the other side of the planet, it, that may be the only time that it can see the rover that's on the other side of the planet. Uh, so you've got to manage the, this notion of, of schedules and times and intermittent connectivity in, in ways that the internet just doesn't really want to do, right? Um, the, the internet assumes that you've, got, that you've always got connectivity. You've always got a, a, an end-to-end -end path. Uh, there's nothing, it turns out, and this goes back to my, my earlier question, there's nothing that turns out you know, in actually IP or UDP that says you have to throw things away if you can't forward them. It's just that everybody does. Um, the, you know, the, the, the mechanisms in TCP for uh, reliability assume that round trips are cheap, right? If I, if I lose something, I can just send it again. Uh, if I need to know something, I can ask the far side and he'll tell me. Um, you know, loss is small. Uh, and then, you know, endpoint-based security. There's, there's a whole security uh, discussion that I don't think I have in these slides. Um, space communications, uh, you know, exhibit all of these characteristics, right? You've got intermittent connectivity. Round trips are not cheap. You, you definitely don't want to spend bandwidth that you have retransmitting things that have already gone across a particular link. Uh, so we were real concerned with being able to transmit data in a way where Unlike TCP, where the sender is responsible for maintaining reliability, uh, we don't have to replow the same ground. If we get something across the link between Mars and Earth, and then it gets lost somewhere between the DSN station and Goldstone and JPL, well, you really want to get it back from Goldstone. You don't want to be getting it back from, uh, you know, sending it back from Mars. Um, it turns out that there are a whole range of environments that have sort of these same characteristics, like sensor networks. Uh, people want to build sensor networks, uh, you know, build sensors into, you know, concrete and lay them into bridges. Well, now it's got to be there for, you know, 40, 50 years, uh, and those sensors have to run, and you're not going to get to, you know, chisel into the middle of the bridge, and, uh, okay, 
Uh, you're not going to get to chisel into the bridge and you know replace batteries and things like that. Um, so, so what can you do, right? Uh, the the way to keep from uh, the way both to use the the links that you have and to sort of maintain the forward progress that you've made uh, without retransmitting from the source uh, is to do something that looks like the Pony Express, right? I've got a letter, I give it to somebody, they write it you know, to the next town down the road and put it down there, and somebody else comes along and picks it up from there and takes it on. Um, and so the, the, the way to, to, to look at this, uh, which is probably far too small to see, I apologize, but the, the notion here is you've got a bunch of links in a path uh, and each one of them is sort of up for some amount of time and then down for some amount of time. And it's only when all the stars align and all of those links are, are all up at the same time that you can actually flow IP data uh, across all of them. Whereas if you, if you take the Pony Express model, which is the thing on the bottom, uh, you can use the individual bits of links as they're available uh, so that you, you know, pro sort of prosecute each link as, it, as it's there. So you send data a little bit and let uh, and then when the next link becomes available, you send it across there. The, the thing that's, that's sort of counterintuitive about this is that, you know, once you, once you look at this, you say, well, you know, this, the, the, the point of this was to be tolerant against these delays and, and, and disruptions when it is available. And all of a sudden, uh, by using the end of pieces of links when they're available, your, your latency to first bit goes down. Right, you can, you know, there, there's, there's likely a way that you can get something from the source to the destination faster it, over little bits of links that aren't necessarily going there at the same time. And if you wait until the end, uh, sort of the, the right side of the top, of the top of where you have to wait for everything to be uh, available at the same time and then, uh, and then send data. Um, let's see, so this is uh, animated and going to be too small to see. The, the notion here is uh, the, to explain this notion of, of, of in-network storage and in-network forwarding. So uh, as data moves through the network, the, the routers that are, that are the, the routers along hops in that network uh, can, can take responsibility for retransmitting that data, making sure that it gets to the destination. Much the same way that in, in the internet, TCP is the thing that provides for reliable data communication at the source takes responsibility for doing the retransmission. But here, what we're looking at doing is, is this sort of in-network transfer where you move data one hop down the road, uh, and so here it's going to move from a ground station and then over to this orbiter. The ground station keeps its copy. The orbiter tells, tells that the ground station has been received. And, and that message doesn't have to be contemporaneous with receiving the data, right? Uh, so that, that even this acknowledgement of receiving the data may come in uh, asynchronously later, but it does, then the, the ground station can, can drop its copy and you can proceed that way uh, and use that to move the data across. Um, as I said, this has been going on for uh, about 16, 17 years. Um, Back in November of 2007, we had an internet research uh, uh, task force working group uh, that was looking at standardizing a protocol for this. And then we got together uh, and actually got an, RFC, an experimental RFC published in, in November of 2007 uh, that spits out, uh, here's what things look like, right? And, and this is your, sort of your standard you know, diagram that you'll see in, in lots of RFCs. You know, here's what the headers look like, here's what goes where, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of rules about how you uh, how you affect these data transfers and how you do the reliability uh, back and forth between uh, between the various routers. Um, and then this is just using that same same figure to say, look, you can use this to get all the way back and forth even when you don't have uh, connectivity from, say, a rover on the surface of Mars back through an orbiter um, and down to Earth. So. Where is this? Uh, right now, uh, the, as, whoop, back. Um, there, there are a couple of things that are going on here. Uh, NASA has got a, a project within the Advanced Exploration Systems uh, that's looking at really the, the, the nuts and bolts and the engineering of how do you make this work. They're not so concerned about standardization uh, or, or interoperability. They're concerned with building tools that, that they can use to get their job done. 
Um, so as part of that, uh, we're actually deploying this onto the International Space Station. You'd think of station as something that's, that's relatively well connected, uh, and, and it is relatively well connected, uh, but still they have issues. Uh, there are a couple of places where they've got exclusion zones, uh, they lose comms. They had uh, problems even just with email. So one of the things that, that NASA ended up doing was writing an SMTP proxy because they couldn't send Outlook, you know, if they had an Outlook email with a large attachment that took a long time to transmit, they'd end up, you know, having to send it two or three times uh, before things actually got through. Um, so right now we're about to go live uh, uh, on the sta on space station. Uh, all the all of this is up there. They're going to be uh, two different gateways, uh, two different sort of border routers for station uh, for the, both the payloads and the operational LAN. So uh, one of the first big. into the package that Marshall Space Flight Center gives out to uh, uh, investigators for how you manage your instrument so that now it gets Marshall somewhat, hopefully, out of the job of going back and pulling stuff off tapes. And right now, if something gets lost on the ground uh, between the ground station and uh, the principal investigator, uh, eventually a phone call comes into the hospital of Marshall, somebody has to go pull a tape. So one of the things that they, that they hope to get out of this is to automate that process and, and manage the same way that you can manage when you know, you're trying to transmit to an orbiter and the orbiter just happens to not be there and you hold on to the data. Well, we can do the same thing for a PI. If you know, the data comes down at some time and the PI uh, machine is not on, the PI is not ready to receive it, you know, they, we can hold on to it and send it to them when they come up. Um, the, uh, so, so as I said, that's about to go live. It turns out that it's sort of odd. Uh, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. We're, we're in the job jar for, uh, for astronaut time, but it's, it's sort of the, when astronauts have free time, they can pick a job from this jar and go do it. Uh, and so we hope to find out relatively quickly uh, when that happens, but we're, we're not entirely sure. Um, in the, in the terrestrial community, in the Internet Engineering Task Force, there's a working group that's looking at a second generation of the communications protocols. Uh, they're going on very actively. Right now, I, RFC, this RFC 50 biz is the, the next generation uh, specification for the communication protocol. Uh, they are either right now in or about to go to last call uh, for that. Uh, and this, the other organization, this Consultative Committee for Space Data System, is looking at how do you standardize this between the space agencies so that you can do interoperability and cross-support. Uh, CCSDS is, all, is, is mostly about uh, how do you ensure that when something goes horribly wrong, uh, I can get all the help that I can possibly get out of the other agencies and their ground stations. So you know, when a satellite goes missing, you really want everybody to be everybody to be sort of speaking the same language so that we can all communicate uh, with that satellite and try to get it back. Um, there are a number of implementations uh, of, of these uh, uh, D10 routers uh, for uh, multiple operating systems: you know, Android, Windows, Linux, Artem's. Uh, you know, some of them, uh, some of the implementations done by NASA are are flight-like. Uh, the implementation that's up and running on, uh, uh, that, that's going to be running on station uh, is one of those. Uh, but there's a real opportunity here uh, to get involved. You can pull these things off of SourceForge uh, and start writing applications that use them. Uh, there's a, a, good, a good sort of place to get started. If you're looking for ideas about applications, there, one of them is called IBR-DTN, uh, done by a university in Germany. Uh, implementations that are good, there's a, uh, ones that were done by the IETF, the, the, the NASA flight-like implementation is actually uh, downloadable from SourceForge. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're looking for are you know, applications that actually can make use of these capabilities. Um, other things, uh, other ways to get involved, uh, this internet, uh, uh, there's an ISOC in a interplanetary networking SIG at ipnsig.org. They're very accessible uh, if you're looking to just sort of understand what's going on and get started. Uh, the, they've got uh, news that comes out sort of uh, just about weekly. 
about what's going on in the, in the area, and then uh, uh, links up here to the, the DTN and the C60. Thank you.